This is the Milwaukee Clipper, one of the last remaining passenger steamers on the Great Lakes. Originally built way back in 1904 and rebuilt in 1940, this ship broke speed records and captured the hearts of the millions who sailed on her. The ship has a soul. When you step on board the ship, you realize that it's not just a hunk of metal. It draws you in. It really does. In this video, we're going to dive into the history of the oldest surviving Great Lakes passenger vessel, learn about the long and illustrious career it had under two completely different identities, and take a detailed tour of the museum ship today. We'll be climbing deep into the lowest parts of this historic vessel, and seeing the hard work going into keeping one of the most important pieces of Great Lakes history afloat after 120 years. Get all the help we can get down here. We need to get our name out there, because if not, this ship might be going to the breakers. In late spring 2023, I was invited to visit the Milwaukee Clipper at her current berth in Muskegon, Michigan. It's been over 80 years since she became the Milwaukee Clipper, and almost 120 years since her first construction as the Juniata. She's clearly worn out and tired, but the first impression is that she's well loved. Her port side was freshly painted. Her starboard side was not yet painted at the time of filming and does look a bit rough, but it was painted shortly afterward. I was invited to come out here with my wife and son, along with my friends Tom and Kayla from Histobrick to tour this ship and share its legacy with the world. The Clipper wasn't always the Clipper, however. When she was first built in 1904, she was almost a completely different vessel and resembled the more classical Great Lakes steamers of the time, such as the famous Kiowatan or the infamous Eastland. The origins of the Clipper can be traced all the way back to 1871 when the Pennsylvania Railroad began operating steamships on the Great Lakes to expand their booming transportation network. Initially they had three small steamers, the China, India, and Japan, operating under the company name Erie and Western Transportation Company. However, due to the iconic anchor emblem on the bow of these ships, they were more commonly known as the Anchor Line not to be confused with the Scottish shipping line of the same name. These ships sailed the American ports of the Great Lakes, stopping in Erie, Pennsylvania, Cleveland, Ohio, and in Michigan they hailed in Detroit, Mackinac Island, and several other ports all along their way to Duluth, Minnesota. Business grew steadily for the Anchor Line as immigrants moved west and tourists flocked to the different parts of the Great Lakes, and by 1902, the trio of small 210-foot vessels were becoming antiquated and incapable of fulfilling the growing passenger demand. It was clear to the Pennsylvania Railroad that the Anchor Line would need to replace these 31-year-old vessels. They entered into a contract with naval architect Frank Kirby, who had already gained fame designing several prestigious Great Lakes vessels, to design a replacement ship with the option to build additional ships from the same template. Three ships came from this design, the Tyanesta, the Juniata, and the Octorera, all named after rivers and towns in Pennsylvania. The Tyanesta was the first ship built by the Detroit Shipbuilding Company and launched at the tail end of 1902 and in service by the summer of 1903. Even while Tyanesta was under construction, the order for a second ship was placed with only minor changes. This was the Juniata. She was built in a different shipyard, the American Shipbuilding Company of Cleveland, Ohio. However, the Anchor Line loved the power plant of the Tyanesta so much that they requested that Juniata's engines and boilers be produced separately by the Detroit Shipbuilding Company, where the Tyanesta was built. The body of the Juniata was built incredibly fast. Her keel was laid in October of 1904, and only three months later, on December 17th, she was launched. From her keel to her main deck, the ship was made of steel. The lower parts of the ship were for ballast, baggage, and engineering spaces, with her main deck being used mostly for freight. 
Early in the Juniata's career, a large compartment for automobiles was added just forward of the engines. Now everything above the main deck was made of wood. The deck above the main deck was known as the berth deck and used almost exclusively for, you guessed it, cabins and berths, with a barber shop towards the aft end. Unlike the excursion steamers that we see plying the southern shores of Lake Michigan at this time, whose voyages were usually less than a day, a round-trip voyage aboard the Juniata between Buffalo and Duluth would take a full week. Therefore, it was necessary to treat the Juniata as a small ocean liner, with each passenger getting private accommodations. The saloon deck, above the berth deck, had a music room forward, finished in mahogany with a piano and library at the aft end of it. Behind that were larger staterooms. And aft of that was a social hall, with stairs going down back to the berth deck, and two sets of doors moving aft into the dining saloon. The dining saloon was initially capable of seating 170 people at once, and considered to be one of the finest dining rooms on the Great Lakes. The most striking feature of the room was the wide, vaulted ceiling running the full length of the saloon. The arched walls on the ends of the vaulted ceiling depict scenes from the 1844 song The Blue Juniata, about a young Native American girl paddling a canoe down the Juniata River, singing about a heroic warrior. One of the two murals depicted the girl singing in a canoe, while the other scene depicted the warrior on the bank of the river waiting for her. At the aftermost end of the deck was a smoke room, which contained a bar. The deck above had a cruise deck house and six parlor suites. The ship carried eight lifeboats, not nearly enough for all on board, but this was honestly common aboard all passenger ships prior to the sinking of the Titanic in 1912. The vessel was sent on her delivery trip on May 14, 1905, sailing from Cleveland to Detroit. There, her older sister, the Tyanesta, sat at the dock loading up. The Juniata approached and tied up alongside of her, waiting. Once Tyanesta departed, the Juniata pulled into the dock, and on May 31st, she set sail on her maiden voyage from Buffalo to Duluth. Juniata raced through the waters of the Great Lakes at a speed of 18 knots, or about 20 miles per hour. Powering her single screw was a 2,500 horsepower quadruple expansion engine built by the Detroit Shipbuilding Company. Although today, the vast majority of the vessel has been rebuilt or replaced, the original engine is still deep below her decks. Making our way down into the engine room right now. So of course we have the engine that dates back to 1904. The engine actually is the oldest part of the ship because it was actually built a few months before the ship was built. So this is the oldest part of the ship. It's the heart of the ship as well. Uh, I got your engine, you got your crankshaft. Uh, right through there is the propeller, the 15 foot propeller. Most of the machinery in her engineering spaces are her original 1904 and 1905 machines with various small modernizations retrofitted over the course of her long career. I just cannot imagine working down here with these engines running and how hot it would have been. The biggest cylinder, the fourth cylinder, is 65 inches in diameter. It was all manually oiled. It was not automatic, so you had to have somebody go around and oil the engine while it was moving. It was a quiet engine as well. They were quiet but reliable engines. They were things you could count on, unlike the modern day diesels. These were ones that, you know, could get you from point A to point B without you having to call a mechanic. Well, why don't you just switch these engines on real quick for us? Sure thing. Let's see them in action. Just go, just go fire them up. Sure, we just have to turn on the first light so I can see the manual. Powering this massive engine were four boilers. Here's your builder's plate for the boilers. Built by American Steamship Company, 1905. Initially, these were coal-fired, but during the conversion to the Milwaukee Clipper, the boilers were converted to burn oil. Uh, here's the original steam gauge. The anchor line ran her until shortly before 1910, when the anchor line introduced a third ship to the fleet, the Octorera. Like the Tyanesta and the Juniata, she was built from the same template set out by Frank Kirby. 
the three ships sailed together until the Panama Canal Act was passed in 1915, which attacked U.S. monopolies and forbade railroad companies from owning ships. As a result, the Pennsylvania Railroad was forced to dissolve the Anchor Line in 1916 and sell off its assets, including the Juniata and her sisters. The Great Lakes Transit Company was formed at this time, essentially buying out all four Great Lakes shipping lines that were divested by railroad companies, which also bought the three Anchor Line vessels and kept their service essentially status quo. That was until the early 1920s when the ships were remodeled, adding an extra deck of cabins to the upper decks and removing the vaulted ceiling of the dining saloon. Throughout the decade, the ship was overhauled several times, being pulled out of service for expensive modifications, and the early 1930s showed a significant drop in passenger travel with the Great Depression. The Tyanesta was laid up, while the other two continued on. The final nail in the coffin for these three vessels came in 1934 with a shipwreck, but one that was fairly far away. Fire at sea, the world's greatest horror of horrors. The ocean liner Morrow Castle, sailing from Havana, Cuba, to New York City caught fire off of New Jersey, with a loss of 135 passengers and crew. After the disaster, the United States passed new regulations to prevent such a disaster from repeating. U.S. government said no more wooden superstructures on ships. Either that or you have to install fire suppression systems. And this was in the 1930s during the Great Depression. And they Many of these companies just couldn't do that, so they had to sell off all their ships. Now, all three ships sat in layup with their futures uncertain. In the late 1930s, Max and Mark McKee entered the story. They were two brothers who owned the Wisconsin and Michigan Steamship Company and were looking for two new steamships to replace their older ones. They hired a naval architect named George Sharp from New York to design a fully fireproof vessel for their new fleet. But it proved to be too expensive to build a new ship. So instead, they asked George to create plans to adapt an older vessel to fit this new design. Juniata was towed from layup in Buffalo to the Manitowoc Shipbuilding Company in Wisconsin, where it was to be completely modernized. She was stripped down to her hull with all traces of the wooden structure removed and trashed. Her engines were kept, as we saw earlier, and her coal-fired boilers were converted to burn Bunker C oil. The structure that was built on the old bones of the Juniata was thoroughly modern, for the time, and designed to be streamlined. It was the first Art Deco passenger ship on the Great Lakes. It was the first all-fireproof vessel on the Great Lakes. And it was also the first all-steel passenger ship on the Great Lakes. So, a lot of firsts with this one. Her structure was now all-steel, inside and out, with her passenger accommodations decorated with ceramic tile. Like the famous ocean liners America and United States, most materials that went into the new ship were fireproof, with advanced fire suppression systems throughout the vessel. Despite the extreme care for safety put into the designing of the vessel, emergency services were abundant. Four large lifeboats were placed on the deck aft of the bridge to be launched with well end davits. Seven life rafts were located aft of that, and an emergency catamaran boat was placed on the after sun deck. Today, the four primary lifeboats are still on their davits. These are the original lifeboats and lifeboat davits. The davits were actually built by the Wellen Company, and is the same company that built the lifeboat davits for the Titanic and several other ships of the era. When she left the shipyard bound for her christening in Milwaukee, she was a brand new ship, completely unrecognizable from the old Juniata. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for the Octorera. Although also bought by the McKees, her plans were abandoned when World War II broke out. She was commandeered first by the U.S. Coast Guard in 1942, and then by the Army the following year, serving in the Pacific Theater as a troop transport. After the war, the Octorera was mothballed in the Sassoon Bay Fleet of San Francisco. And despite attempts from the McKees to reacquire her, she was finally scrapped in 1952. But the Juniata went on. She sailed into Milwaukee, Wisconsin under the command of her first captain of her second life, Captain Alan Hoxie, a tough and seasoned captain who ran a tight ship. 
waiting for her in Milwaukee was a massive celebration. And here, the ship would be renamed. Now, Mark McKee, one of the ship's new co-owners, was on the board of Pan Am Airways at the time, and as a nod to the company, he copied the airline's naming convention for their aircraft. You take the main city on the plane's route and add the word clipper to it at the end to give it an air of sleek reliability. Therefore, here in Milwaukee, the old Juniata was christened the Milwaukee Clipper, with Max McKee's daughter, Patricia, breaking a bottle of Wisconsin cream against the hull and splashing every dignitary there as well. The Clipper then set off for an inaugural cruise for three hours to celebrate with a full 900 passengers aboard. As the festivities ended, the Milwaukee Clipper went right to work with Captain Hoxie taking her out on her maiden voyage under this new identity, departing at midnight. When the Clipper soared into Muskegon, Michigan, she broke the record for fastest crossing, a record that she would break again later in her career. Her route changed a couple of times throughout this career. Initially, she ran between Milwaukee and Muskegon, but that was changed at times to the route from Milwaukee to Chicago. Other times, she ran one route on the weekends and others on the weekdays. Here she comes, the 361-foot Queen of the Great Lakes. The Milwaukee Clipper quickly became a favorite among passengers traveling Lake Michigan, with the simple charm of the interiors, the comfortable amenities, and its streamlined exterior. The cabin deck and sports deck were the two primary decks for passengers. Stepping through the gangway doors and coming aboard through the main lounge on the cabin deck, the passengers are greeted with a friendly welcome inset in the floor's mosaic. Your host afloat. This is the ship's main lounge, a large open space decorated with an array of glass, aluminum, and chrome, and all in the Art Deco style. The room is mostly decorated with furniture rather than fixture, and the furniture was a centerpiece on this ship. It was designed by Warren MacArthur, a student of Frank Lloyd Wright. MacArthur also designed the furniture for the SS America, and it's often been said that the furniture alone is worth more than the ship itself. Most, if not all, of the furniture still has its original upholstery. On the forward end of the lounge is the purser's office and baggage room, standard staples on passenger ships. These were the primary offices for passenger affairs. So in this little closet up here, this was the first ship to shore telephone on any ship, which was crazy at the time because you could call somebody from the water to the land. You could call anybody. And this was actually kind of scary to people at that time, thinking that you could communicate to people like that. Today in the lounge, visitors to the museum can flip through period magazines and watch the sunset over the harbor. Moving aft of the lounge is the buffet restaurant. This space had seating for 185 people and featured an extensive menu, which often included things like lamb, custard, or one of the most popular dishes, broiled white fish with lemon butter. Another really popular meal uh, was spaghetti. For a first class ship, spaghetti was not always seen as a top notch food. Uh, but it was actually one of the things that they sold the most of. And, and pie. So they had a lot of good food on board the ship. Spaghetti and pie. The sailors were never without good food. The meals were prepared on the deck below, down in the galley on the main deck. Most of the machinery and appliances are still in place today. This galley prepared 2,500 meals a day as the ship operated around the clock. Brock, how many, uh, how many cooks would they have in here? Uh, cooks say about on duty, they had about six cooks on duty. Oh, paint. Paint. <laughs> That's what's for dinner. Once the food was ready, it was brought up to the restaurant above by a hand cranked dumb waiter and ready to be served. It was served cafeteria style with servers behind the counter, and once you had what you wanted, a busboy brought your tray over to your table for you. Even though she's a lake ferry, the clipper had a table setting like that of an ocean liner. These are the dishes that would have been out for most of the thing. The, the main plate, the cup and saucer for coffee, the water carafe, uh, either a water glass, or it was also used for orange juice and, and so on. 
the little wooden spoon as a, uh, a throwaway, the bib and the napkin with this silverware that was used on the ship. So, As with so many passenger ships, the captain had his own table where he would dine with certain passengers of his choosing. The captain's table is this front table and that was kept reserved for the captain and his two couple guests that he had. These were Formica at a time when Formica was a brand new thing in 1940. The end result was that uh, putting this compass rose inset into this as a smooth function, this was uh, unheard of at that time. We even have a photograph of the captain dining with passengers aboard. Ironically, he's not seated at the captain's table in this shot though. Dinners were served with a first-class view of the sunset as the clipper steamed across the lake. After their dinner, a passenger would exit the restaurant back into the lounge, moving forward into the ship's grand staircase. A visitor today would see that the staircase is crowned with a mural of the Great Lakes, featuring landmarks from its many shores and prominently showing the clipper in her green color scheme. This mural was added in the 1950s after she was painted green. However, in the 1940s, the ship sailed as white. On the floor is a tile mosaic of the clipper as well. Staying on the cabin deck, we can move outboard, which would take us to passenger cabins. But first, let's take a stop into the restrooms. The women's room is on the port side and the men's room is on the starboard. At the time of our visit, these rooms were being worked on, so they're not quite as presentable as they once were. A curiosity to note about these rooms is that the men's room is pink and the ladies' room is blue. Today we associate blue with men and pink with women, but prior to the 1950s, it was a little more ambiguous. Blue was a feminine color and pink was seen more masculine. The switch didn't come until the 1950s and 60s when female celebrities started popularizing pink and now the color choices of the Milwaukee Clippers lavatories seem odd. Either way, they'll get the job done. Forward of the restrooms, we come to a lobby and stairwell in the midst of the passenger cabin spaces. There are 36 cabins running along the outboard corridors of the Clipper, each with either two or three berths. Although streamlined in design, these rooms have all the comfortable amenities that you would need at sea, especially when a voyage is only around five hours. There's a picture there that always shows these two young, pretty young ladies that are there. There weren't very many pretty young ladies that got in their gotchas and slept in one of these things, but we do know they had a lot of kids that they put to bed so that the parents could go and play cards or dance or just drink. <laughs> Rooms had their bunks, a toilet, electric fans, desks, and a wash basin. The museum today has two of these cabins restored, but they're working on more. We have plans for finishing all of them, but right now uh, that's not high on our on our restoration list simply because uh, we haven't gotten a use for them right now. Running parallel to the outboard cabin corridors are two additional corridors of lounge seating with folding bunks atop them. You may notice that this space resembles a rail car, and it's no surprise, as these spaces were inspired by the famous Pullman rail cars. And today we often refer to the space as the Pullman Lounge, even though it was not ever associated with Pullman. They made them just like a train car. So they brought them up here and they didn't fit. And why didn't they fit? Was because of the camber. This is a steamship and so the decks slope. And so they had to take them all back and, and remake the bottoms of them so that they sloped. 112 passengers could sit in these seats for daytime voyages and the bunks could sleep 46 by night. Curtains could be drawn to give privacy, with each bunk having its own personal light and air vent. The demand fluctuated greatly for these bunks. For most Cross Lake voyages, the trip was too short and the bunks weren't very popular. For the longer trips up from Chicago, there weren't enough of these bunks for everyone who wanted one. The four passenger corridors running parallel all led forward to the club lounge, the forwardmost end of the cabin deck, 
which was exclusive to the passengers who upgraded their fare to a cabin or a bunk. You got pretty good service everywhere, but up here during the day, if you sat in one of these, these, these uh, lounge chairs and you press the button, you promptly got a, somebody to come and wait on you. And they took your order and brought it from way back at the galley. In the summer months, the lounge service was extended into the forecastle, just outside, where waiters could serve club lounge customers. In the winter, the only passenger bookings available were for the club lounge, and the main lounge and the buffet restaurant aft were shut down in order to store automobiles, which we'll get to in a few minutes. Still, passengers could look out the large windows of the club lounge, watch the winter seas crashing, and stay warm and dry inside. The only other space of significance on this deck that we've missed is the fantail. Welcome to the fantail. On the fantail, there's a lot of equipment, but the centerpiece is this wheel here. This is the emergency steering gear. It would have been used in the case that the steam-powered steering gear down below failed. This wheel would take four people to move the large steel rudder down below. And to communicate orders, we have a voice tube right here and the sound-powered telephone over here. And at one point, they did have a Chadburn up here but it has since been removed. Ascending the stairs, either in the forward lobby or up the grand staircase, will put you on the sports deck. The forwardmost part of this deck was the children's playroom, featuring toys, games, and painted murals on the wall. They were painted over in the 80s. One day in, I think, 2006, 2007, before my time, the paint was peeling, and they actually started to see these faces underneath the uh, paint and they put two and two together and said oh my gosh there's paintings underneath here so they scraped and scraped and put lots of hours into restoring these but they got the exact tints of the faces and of the uh, paintings down so these are the original colors that they were painted back in 1941 preserved under paint for 40 years and here they are now the younger set always enjoy the clipper playroom the colorful playroom is appreciated by parents too, for the children may have a wonderful time here. Of course, a nurse was always on duty to supervise the children as they played. Just after the playroom is the theater. A partition stood between the playroom and the theater, but if the movie being screened was a kid's film, that partition was removed so that children could go back and forth between playing and watching the film. Generally, children's films were screened in the mornings, with first-run Hollywood films being screened in the afternoons and evenings. When movies weren't being played, and the ship was close enough to shore, they would screen live television instead. These seats were all manufactured in Grand Rapids, Michigan. The one thing that's interesting about them is these little, these little oak wood strips were seen as a fire hazard, and the Coast Guard was very anal about any wood on the ship. They, they, they fought them. And they went all the way to uh, the Supreme Court, and they were allowed to have these um, on board the ship. The theater could seat 144 people in the early days of the Clipper service, but a part of this space was cut out later in its career to add two steward cabins. So we're in the chief steward's room of the SS Milwaukee Clipper. Uh, back in 1941, this actually would, would have been the theater. The theater is right on the other side of this wall. In 1942, they shrunk the theater, and they gave him his own room. This room is actually, in my opinion, better than the captain's office because you're closer to all the other action on the ship, and also you get a better window, in my opinion. And he has a bed, a shower, sink. This is actually one of the soaps that we still have from the ship. Only a month into her new career, the ship had a bit of a misadventure. Which brings us to the next part of the ship, a space amidships on the sports deck just after the theater now known as the Soda Bowl, but in July 1941, this space was leased out to a Chicago-based entertainment company, who were using the space as a casino. There was actually 12 slot machines set up against this wall. You see, at the time, there were strict gambling laws on both sides of the lake, but the operator of both the Clipper and the casino itself were under the impression that about five miles out, neither state had jurisdiction, and the law simply couldn't be enforced. Later, the authorities found out they came down to the ship, and when they were coming down, Captain Hoxie, who was a captain at the time, uh, got wind of their plans. So he put on civilians' clothes, and he blended in with the passengers, but he told his crew to leave for Milwaukee, and they did. Once they were five miles out on the lake, Captain Hoxie went to the officers and said, you're five miles out, you don't have jurisdiction. 
which is true. But they went down to the ship to shore telephone and called up Milwaukee. They said, we got the captain who's giving us a hard time and we found some gambling machines on the ship. We need you to help us out. So they got a squad down on the other side. Now, with the Chicago police on board and the Milwaukee police waiting for them at the dock, Hoxley had one more trick up his sleeve. The crew actually tried throwing off all the slot machines to make it seem like there was nothing going on, but the officers on board stopped that and the company and the captain were later fined. All charges were dropped, mysteriously I might add, but in 1942 they turned this into the soda bowl, where you could get a nice snack, sandwich. Um, it was more of a uh, family-friendly environment on the ship. There were four women that worked in the soda bowl. That's the outfits that they would use on the ship. The yellow one, they also had the blue one. The yellow one, I believe, is from the uh, 50s and the blue one is from the 60s. And one thing that people know is the blue one got shorter. After the soda bowl is the marine lounge. In the early days of the Clipper, this space was open, without a roof overhead and simply a canvas cover. But in 1949, the solid roof was added to the enclosed space. A 40 by 25 foot oak dance floor is at the center, surrounded by tables along the outboard sides. The room has a nautical theme, with seahorses along the rope stanchions and a woven rope cover on the pillars. A ship's wheel motif decorates the band stage and a rounded bar on the forward end was a stylish place for passengers to get cocktails. Playing on the bandstand, the ship had its own orchestra. For a portion of its career, that band was known as George Kristen and his Milwaukee Clipper Orchestra. They produced souvenir records for passengers, and the Milwaukee Clipper Museum has one of these vinyls. They're fun covers of popular songs, but due to copyright reasons, I can't play them for you. On the far aft end of the sports deck was the sports deck. A space for passengers to play games like shuffleboard, have races, or just simply horse around. During the summer months, the ship was popular with passengers, often selling out, but winter was its dead time. The Coast Guard limited the ship's carrying capacity to 200 in the off-season because they considered that the life rafts were impractical during the colder months. Therefore, the ship could only carry as many passengers as could fit in the full-sized lifeboats. To make up for the lost passenger revenue, the ship was designed to also carry cars in addition to passengers. Passengers who wished to could drive their own cars aboard and keep them below, but the main role of the ship's car compartment was to be carrying brand new cars out of Michigan across the lake to Milwaukee where they would be sold to car dealers. For much of the ship's career, she carried passengers in the summer and cars in the winter, although most of the time she carried a little bit of both. It was on November 7th, 1947, that the Clipper was getting ready to depart one afternoon. Being the off-season, the ship was operating primarily as a car freighter, so only a few people were on board. The weather was rough and stormy when the ship set sail. Rough weather on the Great Lakes can't be underestimated. The Great Lakes are more like seas than lakes and can be nearly as unforgiving as the oceans themselves. Most other captains would have backed down from this weather, but Captain Hoxie didn't. The clipper was underway, riding through heavy waves and high winds, when suddenly a large rogue wave struck her bow. The man at the throttle, who could feel the pulse of the ship's engines and propeller, claims that the ship's screw was out of the water for at least four seconds. The windows in the club lounge were blown in, and several of the adjacent staterooms were flooded came across and smashed these windows out. And it also damaged two staterooms aft. As seas continued to break over the bow, the crew needed to plug up holes where once were windows. They used mattresses from the staterooms and propped them up using lounge furniture. Fortunately, the storm was subsiding and around this time, the waves stopped breaking over the bow. The Clipper made it to Milwaukee, where steel plates were bolted over the broken windows as a temporary repair. And on the outside windows right here, you can see this is where they would have stuck those steel plates on to add protection in rougher seas. After 75 years, the bolts remain. They continued to use these bolts for metal window covers whenever there was bad weather. The Clipper continued its car carrying service throughout the winters. 
So lucrative was the car contract, and so high was the demand for moving these cars, that the Wisconsin and Michigan Steamship Company bought an additional ship exclusively to carry these cars. And boy did they go all in on this thing. This was a surplus military ship left over from the Second World War meant to carry troops, tanks, supplies, and even landing boats into battle. This was LST-393, which the company renamed Highway 16. The ship served in both Sicily and Normandy during the war, and would now sail alongside the Milwaukee Clipper carrying additional cars across the lake. It was also intended to be used as the company's only car carrier when the Clipper was laid up for maintenance in the off-season. In 1953, the McKee brothers attempted to expand their business by purchasing an old C-4 freighter named the Marine Star. As with the old Juniata, they contracted George Sharp to design a modern, streamlined passenger ferry on the bones of the old ship. While the Clipper would remain the luxury way to travel with its capacity for just 900 passengers, this new, larger ship would be the budgeted way to go, with a capacity of about 2,500 but she would be anything but plain. She was complete with six restaurants, two dance halls, and several lounges, all in the Art Deco design just like the Clipper. This new ship would be known as the Aquarama, and work began on her right away. 1953 also seems to have been the year for falling overboard. Around dusk on August 10th, as the ship was in the middle of the lake, a man overboard cry went up. The ship's first mate, Clarence Van Dongen launched a boat with a small rescue party as the Clipper's searchlight combed the area. An unconscious young lady was found floating face down, and quickly and efficiently she was pulled aboard the rescue boat. Back aboard the Clipper, she was resuscitated. It was found out later that she didn't fall overboard. She jumped. The crew kept her under watch until she was admitted to the hospital in Muskegon. That same season, Mark McKee, co-owner of the vessel, was sailing on board with his pet dog. As the ship was getting underway, the dog leapt overboard into the lake. First mate Van Dongen once more took a boat out and managed to rescue the dog. Later, the crew joked with him that the woman earlier in the season was the practice round for getting ready to save the boss's dog. Fortunately, both were okay, and first mate Van Dongen rose up the ladder and eventually took over as the ship's captain in 1954. Throughout the rest of the 1950s, it was mostly smooth sailing for her, with a few incidents of note. She lost her rudder in one of her off-seasons. She was repainted to a green color scheme in 1957. In 1959, a seaman was found dead on board of natural causes. It was in 1960 that one of her major accidents occurred. She departed Milwaukee in a thick fog in the morning of May 28th with 465 souls on board. Souls, of course, referring to both passengers and crew. She was now under the command of a Captain Prefer, who had taken command of the ship at the start of the season. Creeping along through a blanket of fog, the Clipper was traveling at a cautious pace. Visibility was non-existent, and as it turns out, the ship was slightly out of position. The Milwaukee breakwater suddenly appeared in the distance, and the ship just simply couldn't stop. She rammed it head on. Although the damage was minimal, 14 people were injured after having been thrown around by the sudden stopping. The bow was dented in three inches, and she was out of service for two weeks, requiring about $7,000 of repair. In January 1961, the Clipper was serving in her off-season car ferrying duties when she and three other car ferries all became trapped in ice just beyond the Milwaukee breakwater. This happened several more times throughout that winter, and the following one. And in 1962, it was announced that the Milwaukee Clipper would officially be a summer-only ship, retiring her from her winter car duties. Her fleet mate, the Aquarama, which sailed the Detroit River, was a financial failure despite being well-loved by its select passengers, and this severely hurt the Clipper line. The McKee brothers wanted to move the Aquarama to the Milwaukee and Muskegon route to replace the Clipper, but she was too big to fit into the Milwaukee Harbor without dredging it, which was a costly process that the city refused to pay for. Aquarama was retired in 1963, but she would bounce around different layups for many more years. September 10, 1970, under the command of a Captain Carl Reagan, 
the Clipper made her final trip for the Wisconsin and Michigan Steamship Company. The year was actually one of the most profitable ones for the ship, but other factors were at play. Regular maintenance costs were rising and the ship needed expensive repairs, while the Coast Guard was becoming more and more scrutinous of the aging vessel. Additionally, the McKee brothers were unhappy that Milwaukee refused to dredge their harbor after all that the company had done for the city. The American flag that flew from her mast on this final voyage is still preserved in the onboard museum below decks. Last time they ran the engine. Is that 71? Yep, se uh, 71. September 17th, 1971 at 11. The Clipper sat at her slip, awaiting her fate for seven years. There were parties interested in purchasing her, but they fell through. Others talked about scrapping her, but this too never happened. In 1977, she was sold to James Gillen, who created the Illinois Steamship Company. Mr. Gillen was not seeking a business opportunity. He was looking for a way to save the ship that he loved. He had her towed from her slip in Muskegon to Wisconsin for a complete refurbishment with the plans to return her to service as soon as possible, but the cost of repairs and the time that they took were greater than expected. The company fell into debt, and the ship was seized by creditors. So the ship sat for a few more years as Mr. Gillen continued to work to rescue the ship, while the creditors tried to find someone to buy her. Then, the Maritime Museum of Port Washington, Wisconsin had a clever idea to help all parties. They proposed to accept the ship as a donation from the creditors, who in turn could take a tax write-off by donating it to a nonprofit, and then they would appoint Mr. Gillen as custodian of the ship. That was a major win for everybody. The ship was renamed simply The Clipper, dropping Milwaukee from the name, and towed down to Chicago, where then-Mayor Jane Byrne allowed it to be docked at the Chicago Navy Pier free of charge. There, it would be fixed up and serve as a floating museum. It was thanks to the efforts of James Gillen that the ship was saved at all, which earned him the title of the ship's guardian angel. Major repairs were made and a bar was added to the club lounge and the main lounge, which we still see today. As the ship sat in Chicago as a museum, it was very much alive. The restaurants all functioned, the dance floor was lively, and passengers could still get drinks in the club lounge. In 1983, she became a national landmark. Sitting at the Navy Pier, the ship had its own branding in the lounges and restaurants, such as these napkins and coasters, which feature an Art Deco rendition of the ship and say, aboard the SS Clipper, a national landmark at the Navy Pier in Chicago. The ship was turning a profit, but slowly. The main problem was that the Navy Pier at the time was closed to the public, so any visitors to the Clipper needed a special escort when they walked through the pier to the ship. That all changed when Chicago Mayor Harold Washington opened the pier up to the public and visits to the ship boomed. Mayor Washington had a soft spot for the Clipper, frequently hosting mayoral parties and press conferences aboard her. And that's not all. This room might not look like much, um, but at one point this is where the mayor of Chicago had an apartment. Early, the, the mayor of um, Chicago loved the Clipper. Loved it so much that he actually asked for his own kind of office on the ship slash room. So we got this kind of office that they used to use for the uh, stewardess, stewardesses on the ship. And they turned it into the mayoral bedroom on the Clipper. They had a bedroom and office on the ship. Many people don't know that in Chicago, so we have history all over the Great Lakes. While Mayor Washington did so much to promote the ship, the city didn't share the same enthusiasm. Mayor Washington died in office, and that very same day, an eviction notice was served to the Clipper. Another lawsuit ensued that lasted for years until ultimately the ship was seized and put up for auction. The city of Hammond, Indiana had just built a new marina, and instead of spending the excess money on a traditional marina clubhouse, they used the money to purchase the Clipper and bring it to their marina to act as that clubhouse. The ship was towed from Chicago to Hammond and dedicated in June 1991 after being given a new coat of paint and once more being named the Milwaukee Clipper. In this time, intense efforts were made to bring the ship up to code and make it handicap accessible. 
Around this time too, the pantry area behind the serving counter of the restaurant was remodeled to be a full kitchen, rather than just a pantry relying on the antiquated galley below. The ship turned a profit here, but the longevity of the site was uncertain, with further repairs being needed. By the end of 1995, the ship was closed once more. It was towed to a nearby coal dock and forgotten by everyone, except for a small group of enthusiasts. This small band of enthusiasts got together and created the Great Lakes Clipper Preservation Association, a non-profit 501c3 with the goal of preserving the Milwaukee Clipper for generations to come. The group secured a new berth for her in her old home of Muskegon. The ship was towed up the lake by the tugboat John Purvis, departing shortly after midnight on December 2nd, 1997. As the ship approached Muskegon that afternoon, throngs of people came out to watch her return. An aircraft even flew out over the lake to greet her. Climbing up a ladder while still at sea, the Clipper returned to Muskegon under the command of her former captain, Captain Bob Prefer. The ship was brought into the channel and maneuvered into her berth at the foot of McCracken Street, where the Grand Trunk Railroad used to have a ferry. It was a heartwarming sight for so many families in Muskegon, many of whom credit the Clipper for helping to grow their city to what it's become and generating so much revenue for them when the ship was in service. This pier has been her home since 1997, with a team of dedicated volunteers keeping her alive. They've battled storms to keep her afloat. They've looked after her diligently and kept the ship well maintained. They fought the uphill battle of fundraising through the last couple of decades, all while preserving her history and sharing it with the world. When we stepped aboard, we were taking a step back in time. In coming aboard, we can nearly relive the old Cross Lake journeys this old ship used to take. It's like a time capsule, yeah. You know, someone compared it as to getting into the DeLorean and heading back, you know, in yeah. time, because nothing has really changed with the ship. There are some small things that we had to do, you know, to yeah. be up to code, uh, but a majority of the stuff is as it was. You know, you have the pilot house here and the original paint scheme that it was back yeah. in the 1940s. The pilot house is where the skippers of the Clipper commanded her across the lakes. From Captain Hoxie, her first captain after her rebirth, to Captain Prefer, who at 101 years old still serves as the ship's honorary captain. This is where her captain stood. And the captain's chair here is where they sat. Most of the equipment are original pieces of equipment from the 1940s, such as the helm and telegraphs, with some exceptions being pieces that were added later in her career, such as the radars. However, another unique piece is the radio direction finder. This piece is actually the original from 1904 installed on the Juniata. So we have a one degree, one and a half degree starboard list. The anchor, the port side is down, but the starboard side anchor is up. So mm -hmm. it could be called a little bit. It could be. Apparently this spittoon, this isn't the original one to the ship. The original one uh, took a little bit of a swim. Uh, back in 1941, when the ship was starting, the wheelsmen were notorious for spitting their tobacco and missing. And it was almost a game. They would miss on purpose because they didn't have to clean it up. Uh, they had one of the deckhands do it. Captain Robert Prefer, who started out as a deckhand, actually as a dishwasher, made his way up to captain. And one of his jobs was to clean up the ground in the pilot house. He hated that job. He could not stand it. When he got a call from headquarters in 1960 telling him that he was the captain, he was so excited, but instead of celebrating, calling up his mom or dad to tell him, I got the job, he went up to the pilot house, told the wheelsman, if you're gonna spit, you're gonna spit in the bucket, or you're not gonna spit at all. And he threw the spittoon off the side of the ship. But he made his point clear that if you're gonna spit and miss, you're gonna be off the ship yourself. He feels the power. After the pilot house is the officer's quarters, including the captain's cabin. So we're in the captain's office of the Milwaukee Clipper. As, as it is, it's the captain's office and his bed. Probably the nicest accommodation on the ship. He had his own bathroom, he didn't have to share it with anybody else. He, he had the biggest bed as well on the ship. But what's interesting about this room, in the 1950s, when they carried brand new automobiles on the ship in the winter, 
They would put them everywhere on the ship. Any space that they could, because every extra car they got, there was more change in the owner's pocket. Also more change in the captain's pocket. Because they would put cars everywhere. They would even take them apart and put them in, into other rooms. You would have a motor here, you'd have a door here, you'd have a door here. The captain did not want anything in his room. And the joke was, they would put a car everywhere but the captain's cabin, because the door was too small. When visitors board the ship today, the first thing they enter is a museum space, which features artifacts from the ship's career, both as the Juniata and the Clipper. A model gallery is forward of there, with interesting models of several ships from the Great Lakes, including the infamous SS Eastland, which sank in downtown Chicago in 1915, a subject that I've made an extensive documentary about on my channel. Another gallery features artifacts from the Aquarama, the former fleetmate of the Milwaukee Clipper. The Aquarama hung around for decades after her final voyage in 1963 until she was finally scrapped in Turkey in 2007. The gift shop is also in this part of the ship, where I got me some mugs. As extensive as the museum collection is, there are some historically significant pieces still missing. We are still missing our bell that was taken off in South Chicago. It's a beautiful cast bronze bell. It says SS Juniata. There are some items that have been taken off the ship. If people have an item from the Clipper, maybe you can bring it down to the Clipper and bring it back to its original home. We got a Chadburn back last year, so we're piecing the ship back together. Back up on deck, the sun is starting to go down. This is the sun deck the landscape of which is dominated by the Clipper's streamlined funnel. But this isn't actually a funnel. It's meant to give the impression of one to complement the ship's lines, but it's entirely fake. It houses a fan room and a generator space, with a platform on the very top that we climbed up to. On top of the false stack, well, there would actually be um, a band that would play on nice days. Um, while people were dancing below, they would put a band up here. It was really just a nice way to change things up from the dance floor and move people upstairs. Of course, I wouldn't really want to play up here and lug all the equipment up here. Wouldn't that be a fun to me? <laughs> Can you imagine in rough conditions having to play up here as the ship is rocking back and forth? And Brock, you said earlier that they would clip like a like a harness or something into this? Clip into there if they needed to. And they, that way they could still play. I'm not going to lie, that's kind of insane. Huh? Just stick the band in the funnel. <laughs> they'll be fine. Yeah, they'll, they'll manage. <laughs> yeah. I guess the real band looked a bit cooler up here than us doing our air guitar and keyboard. <laughs> the ship's actual smokestack is this tower on the aft end of the sun deck. Of course, we couldn't pass up the opportunity to climb up that as well. The triple chime whistle that we see at the top of the funnel predates her conversion to the Milwaukee Clipper, but doesn't date back all the way to the 1904 construction of the ship. The whistle was added during one of her 1920s refits, replacing her original single chime whistle. So I'm up the mast right now, the aft mast. Kind of holding on here. <laughs> These ladder rungs are quite small. I can't fit both feet on a single rung. But we're pretty high up. As the sun set, it was time to switch on the ship's power for one final tour below before we say goodnight to her. So it's getting a little late on board. We're turning on the inverter, which is going to turn on most of the exterior lights. Yeah, well, the inverter, um, it does, um, it powers all the DC uh, outlets and DC lights on the ship. So lots of the exterior lights were DC. Uh, along with some of the interior lights still. Look at the shadow of where the needle head has oh, yeah. just always been. And this one's been all over the place. <laughs> We've now seen most of the ship's passenger accommodation, so now let's start going deeper below deck, beyond just the engine rooms which we saw earlier. As we get lower into the ship, we enter the old parts of the Juniata. If parts of the ship are welded together, it's from the Clipper. If something is riveted, we're looking at the old Juniata from 1904. So we're in the fuel tanks now. And this would have been the coal bunker at one point. 
they would actually have to heat the uh, fuel to get it on board because it was so thick, it was like a tar. So to get it actually moving, they had to heat it up, and then to get into the boilers, they had to superheat it. The, uh, well, the waste on the battleships when they would burn the oil, this is the byproduct. So this is running off of the byproduct of battleships. Correct. It burned about 5,500 gallons of oil per round trip. We descended further down into the lowest parts of the hull, which in the Clipper era was one of her many car decks. The cars were driven aboard the ship and loaded through the gangway doors. To make it easier to load cars, they cut through this bulkhead. A decision we questioned the safety of. Seems like a weak point to me. If you ever develop a leak or you hit something and you compromise this room, this is a big bulkhead to flood. It's mm -hmm. like the middle of the ship. A thick layer of soot blankets the ceiling, and graffiti written by fingers can still be seen with some interesting old messages. How much lower does it go? Uh, about two feet when you're at the double bottom. You just fall through, <laughs> water starts pouring Talking in. Talking about how I'm like, oh, that's it. The ship is so strong. And you start flooding the one compartment that shouldn't be flooded because it's yeah, cut the open. <laughs> <laughs> They're the original bed frames to the Juniata. Wow. Yeah. In one of the forwardmost compartments on the port side are additional accommodations for seasonal crew. These were mostly steward and wait staff. There were bunk rooms and a bathroom in this small section of the vessel. From there, we move forward into the forepeak. If you look at these beams up here, you can still kind of see how they're bent from when the uh, ship hit the breakwater in the 60s. Okay, you ready to head down for the last room? Oh, we're going down, okay. We're going down. Not too many bad, like, rusty spots on this ship, though. No. Thank you. The lowest part of the four-peak tank is actually flooded, but the walls showed signs of an even deeper flooding at one point. Can I, can I go down there? If you want to. I, I want to. You can. Dude, I, I'm, go, I'm doing it. There's no, like, I don't know, like, Loch Ness Monster down there, is there? I'm going down at the lowest level of the four-peak right now. And in order to even out the keel, if you're looking at the ship's profile, they've flooded three feet of water down here. And the idea of going into a flooded compartment seems a little too exciting to pass up. This hatch they always keep open, so there's no buildup of fumes down here. It's been ventilating since they flooded it. But I'm still not going to stay in here too long. It is muggy down here. Muggy? Yeah. Like, like humid. It smelled musty in there, and the rungs of the ladder were rusty. There's burned wood down here. Guys, there's a flashlight down here, an old one. In the water, do you see that? Isn't that a chalk mark or a water, like water level indicator? Where? To your left, uh, farther back. Um, that? Yeah, the white level. No, that's a pen. It's a pen. That's a pen that's floating. Ah, that's my pen. <laughs> Back out of the flooded compartment, we moved aft into the far stern of the ship and explored some of the steering gear and other crew spaces. We're gonna go check out the generator room now. The generator room is just above the engine room and a little bit forward. We're actually kind of overlooking it like a balcony. So you just, you don't touch these anymore, huh? No, not really. The old Juniata, the Milwaukee Clipper, or just the Clipper, has finally made her home here in Muskegon, but there are hopes to move her to a more downtown location where visitors will have better access to her. Right now, her main issue is that people simply don't know that she's there. We had to go to the western part of town and follow signs into what looks like a restricted area and is locked behind a gate. This gate is opened during visiting hours. The Clipper can be visited during the summer months on the western end of Muskegon as she sits right next to the Lake Express High Speed Ferry, reminiscent of the ship's old ferrying days sailing the same route as the Clipper, but doing so in a fraction of the time. The dock where the Clipper sailed in and out of in downtown Muskegon is now home to another museum ship, the World War II LST-393 
Yes, this is the old Highway 16 that was owned by the same company, which has since been restored to her original World War II LST configuration. If they were able to move the Milwaukee Clipper to some sort of nearby mooring, it would help to tell the story of when these ships worked together, and it would ensure the Clipper's longevity by giving it greater exposure and easier access to the public. The Milwaukee Clipper is a reminder of a lost era of Great Lake travel and an Art Deco time capsule. She's one of three National Historic Landmark ships designed by the famous naval architect George Sharp, the other two being the NS Savannah in Baltimore and the Victory ship SS Lane Victory in San Pedro, California, of which I'm technically a crewman of. The Clipper is kept alive by donations and volunteer efforts. In the past year, they've successfully executed a vast array of projects, spanning from intricate painting to comprehensive plumbing and electrical work. Their dedicated team of volunteers has triumphantly achieved numerous milestones. Remarkably, in 2023 alone, they logged over 4,000 volunteer hours on board. They envision the Clipper as the focal point of Muskegon. Their long-term vision includes establishing a waterfront haven, complete with a botel, if you will, or a hotel on board, a restaurant, bar, and a banquet center, redefining Muskegon's waterfront experience. While you might not be able to volunteer, you can help out significantly by donating to the Clipper. Every dollar goes to one of their many onboard projects to keep the ship around for generations to come. Government does not want to help us out at all, unlike the other ships in the area. We rely solely on private donations, which is very sad. I mean, we, we manage, but we can't do nearly enough projects that we want to do on board the ship. For more information, visit MilwaukeeClipper.com. My friend Tom at Histobrick, who joined me on this project and was a huge help filming this along with his girlfriend Kayla, they put together a Lego kit in his store. It's a profile cutaway model of the Milwaukee Clipper, and it's all using official Lego parts that have been curated by hand. And the proceeds of it are being donated to preserving the Milwaukee Clipper. This kit is available at histobrick.com. I want to thank the Milwaukee Clipper Preservation Association and the volunteer crew of the Milwaukee Clipper for inviting us out, hosting us, and giving us such a phenomenal tour of their wonderful vessel. Raymond Hilt, Brock Johnson, and Barrett West for being such a wealth of knowledge while writing this video, and the writers of the book SS Milwaukee Clipper, an illustrated history for creating such a good resource. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe, and also consider joining my YouTube channel memberships or my Patreon at the link in the description below. A special thank you to my supporters, especially Marlo Perez, Kelly Black, Kaiser Wilhelm II, Kaiser Friedrich III, Zach Richards, Donald Anderson, Cody Henricks, Joan Haynes, Sean Kimball, Glenn Bittescombe, Steven Schwankert, Gabriel Colomb, Nick K, RGB, Tara Molikar, Keith Holland, Miles Garrett, Jennifer, Rob M, Amos Mayhew, Corey Andrews, Nicholas Masella, Cole Tannock, Sophie Baber, Rob, Oliver Chin Chen, John Miluski, David Watipka, Tiffany Raritan, Er, mm, Mad Time Media, Nathan Gutierrez, Max Metcalf, David Littlejohn, Sean Sahi Fraser, Nikki Chan 92, Corbin McDonald, Matthew Burns, Goblin of the Salt Plains, Luke Stevens, Gordon Robbins, Aaron Stark, Troy Wentworth, and Clarkie.